The Spirit had convinced them of this. As the old writers and old preachers would say it, the law worked. The work of the law had accomplished its purpose. And when we talk about the law work and along with side the gospel work, it's a balance that is often difficult to strike. On the one hand, if there's no declaration of God's law, of who he is and what he's commanded, of the consequences of breaking his law, then the gospel becomes simple psychological assistance with no salvation from God's judgment. On the other hand, if God's law is overemphasized, the gospel often ends up being minimized to the point that it's seemingly impotent, insignificant, incapable of saving. But when sin and death and hell are faced head on and the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ alone is declared, then the Holy Spirit saves. And Peter's preaching at Pentecost is case in point. They're pierced to the heart, responding with the question, what shall we do? How can we alleviate the conviction that we feel? Is there a way out? Is there hope? And Peter says in verse 38, our second point, I'm glad you asked. Repent. Repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This desperate cry from the crowd, what shall we do, is answered by Peter, repent and be baptized. The only proper response to the gospel is repentance. Nothing else will suffice. When John the Baptist came, Luke chapter 3, he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Not just John the Baptist, Jesus himself, Mark 1.15, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Peter is doing not just what John the Baptist did, not just what Jesus himself did, he's doing what Christ commissioned his disciples to do. Luke 24, 46 and 47, Jesus said to them, thus it is written, that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name. This command to repent is described by Matthew Henry, the great commentator, as a plank after a shipwreck. It doesn't feel so much like a hard command when we think about it like that. You see what's happening in the crowd that day? Peter's preached the gospel. They're utterly convinced that they're sinners, that they're deserving of hell. They're asking the question, is there any hope? We're willing to do whatever. And Peter, as it were, throws them a plank. The ship has been sunk. They're on the way down. It's been shattered. There's no hope for them. And a plank is there to hold them up. Peter's call for repentance is not some hard demand. It's salvation being freely offered to those who are perishing. Repent. Repentance is far more than we often realize. It is the turning around of the whole man. You you often hear it said that repentance is a change of mind, and it includes that. But most of us change our minds about things numerous times a day. Repentance is far more than that. It's a true sense of sin. It's real grief and hatred of sin. It's a decisive forsaking of sin and forsaking of self-sufficiency. It is and includes an embracing of faith and ongoing discipleship in Christ. It's far more than just feeling sorry about something that we've done. It's not simply a change in attitude. It is inextricably bound up with the apprehension of mercy. It's sorrow for sin without 
pardon, sorrow with sin, sorrow over sin without turning to Christ is simply self-pity. It's not just being sorry. It's turning to Christ and recognizing the forgiveness that's offered only in Him. It is, as I stated initially, a directional change of life, a complete turning towards God in Jesus. Jesus. 